Hi, everyone. We are here with Sister Rebecca Janacek today talking about her, her journey and her amazing ministry at Promise Point and her book. So, Sister, thanks for making time to talk to us. How are you doing today? I'm fine. Doing well after a, a not so good week last week <laughs> with the bad weather, but fine today. I can only imagine being the executive director of Promise Point and the people under your care, but sounds like you got through everything just fine. So. We did. We did. Uh, everybody just kind of hunkered down. And of course, the, the people at Promise Point are used to living out on the street. So being in cold weather and without was not a big difficulty for them. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, sister, you know, I think I'd really like to just start this conversation back at the beginning, your, your journey into religious life. How did you become a sister of the Incarnate Word and Blessed Sacrament? Well, I, uh, I guess I felt the desire back when I was a teenager. Um, strange enough, it was from two movies. Uh, one was called The Trouble with Angels, and the other one was The Nun Story. And um, I just felt a desire that I wanted to get out and serve, and in particular, become a missionary in Africa. Um, but the missionary orders here in the United States or down in Texas were at that time were mainly um, located in their, they had their houses of origin uh, in the, on the East Coast. And I couldn't go there because we didn't have the money. So my mom suggested that I look around and I had an aunt in the Incarnate Word Sisters, but I didn't know her very well. And so mom suggested, she said, why don't you go there, check it out. And if this is really when you want to be a sister, well then, you know, later on, maybe you can move on elsewhere. Well, I joined the sisters and found that this is where I belonged and just put the idea of a missionary as a little girl's dream and just left it in the wayside. But in 1980, uh, our sisters from Mexico they're a separate congregation, but there are sisters, Incarnate Word sisters, decided to start a, a time in Kenya to start a missionary journey over there. And so I volunteered and uh, made sure that I had, I was a nurse at that time, but I was an LVN. I went to become a registered nurse. So I went to school, got all my things together, and in 1985, presented myself to the community and said, hey, I'm ready to go to Africa, but they weren't quite ready to send me yet. So um, they, I, I spent time working in Yoakum Hospital, getting myself prepared. And in January 1987, uh, I started out and I arrived in Kenya on the 6th of January. So that's how I got to become a sister and found myself in Africa doing the work that I loved. Wow, sister, I just keep thinking about in your story how God uses our ordinary circumstances to define our path. You know, it's, it's um, oh, I couldn't afford to go there, so I went here, and that's where I wound up to be. It seems like sometimes in life we want God to work in such big, miraculous ways when he says, no, look, look at what I have on your to-do list today. Mm -hmm. Look at what I'm putting around you. And that can help you find your path. So I've also heard a lot of people been in, being inspired by movies. What was it about those two movies that made you think about uh, even more so about becoming a sister? It was, I think it was just about doing good for people, reaching out uh, and, and serving people, serving God's people. Uh, and the, yeah, the prayerfulness of, and, and the idea that you can't do this alone that we have to do it in community. And so it was kind of like I was looking around for who who else has the same idea that I do and would like to do it. And because I, I knew I couldn't do it by myself. So joining the sisters just made sense. Mm -hmm. Hey, these women think as I do, and uh, we can we can do this work together and with support. That is beautiful. I've also heard a saying that uh, saints come in clusters. So we cannot become like Christ on our own if we try to do that yeah. and work out yeah. We need each other. Yeah. So how many years were you in Africa? Uh, actually 31. I, I went there, I arrived in January of uh, 1987 
and I left in December of 2017. So, was a, Did you think it was be that long when you when you first arrived. What was it, January sixth, 1986? 1987. 1987. <laughs> Did you think you'd be there 31 years? No, I didn't. In fact, I had originally made a commitment for just three years. Wow. Um, but then it it was like I felt that after I'd been there for two years, I just had barely stuck my feet in the water and was I didn't feel that I could really I had much to give to the community at that stage because I was absorbing everything, absorbing all the new things. And of course, I had to it was a new culture, a new language, and I was way deep in the bush. So there were a lot of things that we didn't have. We didn't have electricity. We didn't have uh, running water. We didn't have those kinds of things. So it was a big adjustment, um, but I loved it. I was kind of duck, like a duck to water. I enjoyed it. It just fit like a glove, basically. It it did, yes. And that longing in your heart was met in reality. In oh, yes. Everything. So you must have been on cloud nine thinking, I'm doing exactly what I wanted to do when I was a little kid. I, I did. I found that and I just, I just felt blessed all the time. And felt supported by my family, my sisters back here. And and the book came about because I was writing, I mean, I didn't write it as a book. I, I was writing newsletters home to my family because I didn't want to be forgotten out there in the bush. So I was making sure that everybody knew what was happening. And it, and it wasn't just my ministry. It was a ministry of everybody, all my sisters behind me and my family members. Um, that I was free enough to go. I had my health, I had my youth, and um, I had the skills to pay it forward, as it were. And so I've, I felt that I owed it to all of the people back home supporting me to let them know what was happening and um, give, give them an idea of what it was because I knew they couldn't be there along with me. Yeah, it's... Um... So really need to see the book, folks. So Letters Out of Africa and find on Amazon. I even see here at the beginning, sister, that all the proceeds go back to the Sisters of the Incarnate Word and Blessed Sacrament, all the prophets. So, so that's pretty neat. And I see so many local organizations. And even the first chapter is an article from the Yoakum Herald Time talking about you embarking on your mission. So I just find it so neat how this this um, these letters refer back to this area and how your vocation came out of this area, much like we just saw Father Gary get appointed as a bishop. You know, these yeah. amazing vocations coming out of the Diocese of Victoria. Yes. <laughs> so, Sister, um, folks can find this book on Amazon, but if, if you don't mind sharing, what are some of your favorite memories from your time in Africa? Um, I guess the the mobile clinics. What we did, we had uh, small clinics, two small clinics that we worked out of, and we would pick up, a, um, we had our pickup trucks, and we would load on there all of our medicines, all of the things we needed to do to give immunizations to the children, to see the pregnant women doing antenatal clinics, and also curing those that were ill. And we would pile all of that into our, the back of our pickup trucks and drive out to where the people were. And we did call these mobile clinics. So I just loved them because it was, it was a way and we, there was no infrastructure in the area. So there was no transport for people to come to us. So we had to go to them. And they're semi, the Pocot are semi-nomadic. So they kind of move from, as the season changes and they need water, they need grass for their animals, they would move. So we would just move along with them and follow them and would do monthly clinics. And I just really enjoyed that and felt that was that was the way to reach the people, to go to them, not expect them to come to us. Yeah, what a great uh, testimony about how we're supposed to be as Christians. Uh, sometimes it feels like we're waiting for people to come to us we want people to show up at our doors, but we're really meant to go out to them. And you went all the way to Africa <laughs> to reach the people the Lord was calling you to reach. Um, what, were, what were some of the greatest challenges during your time in Africa? And how do you feel like God was trying to stretch you or, or rely more on him as you went through those things? 
well, the, there were times when, when uh, I had difficulty working with the government, uh, trying to convince the government that these people did matter. Mm. We kind of, we as missionaries out in that far out region felt that we needed to be the bridge between the developing Kenya and the undeveloped Kenya and that these people were going to be left out and walked over because the other people didn't care about them. And so it was, it was a, a big hardship trying to convince the government that they owed it to the people there. You know, they, they felt that these people weren't giving them anything. You know, they weren't paying taxes. They weren't doing uh, things. And they're, so it was, it was a difficult time. Uh, that was my biggest challenge is working with them. Also, yeah, just working with nature uh, because the, the roads were bad and uh, we'd get caught in the rivers. I almost lost a pickup truck in the river once. We were was taking somebody down to, to a big hospital in Nairobi to have a surgery and um, the river rose and I was in the middle of it. <laughs> oh my gosh, sister. Well, <laughs> and uh, anyway, we managed to get out and, uh, but it was a scary time, it was a challenge. Oh my goodness. And then also like there were times when we would have diseases. We had an outbreak of meningitis. We had an outbreak of yellow fever and trying to attend all of these people with, with the few resources that we had was very difficult. And I often had to just watch people die because I knew that I couldn't get any other help for them. And so to be there and to be a comfort with them when, when I knew that there was nothing that could be done. Wow, it sounds like God just had to use your, he probably stretched your heart during, I mean, just using all of you to uh, reach these people. I mean, even when you couldn't, um, and all you could provide was comfort. That's just beautiful. Um, and you know what you said, I mean, that's the role of all Christians. We're here, we're meant to be a voice for the voiceless. And uh, everyone has that dignity to human life. Your, your dignity is not based on what you can do for me. It's just that you are and God made you. Uh -huh. So um, any other major lessons learned, sister? Things that maybe you went in thinking about what it would be like to be a missionary and, and um, surprises along the way of, oh, this this really wasn't expected. I didn't, this, this wasn't in the training manual, although I know there's probably not really a training manual for the work you were going to do. I found that I got more than I gave. I uh, I saw the face of God in these people and in the landscape, the whole area. I saw the face of God and um, it changed me, made me uh, be more appreciative of, of the gifts I had and the idea that I have a duty to pay those gifts forward not to keep them, they're not my own. Mm -hmm. They were given to me to be given away. And that was a big a big thing for me. So on that note, uh, you kept giving when you returned here. So, so tell us a little bit about the journey home and the journey in the Promise Point. Well, I when I left Kenya, I left because I'd worked myself out of a job. Um, I There were enough nurses there. The, local, the children had now gone to school. They were trained as nurses. And even as far as our sisters, our incarnate word sisters, when I first went there, we had none, none of the Kenyan sisters. And when I left, we had 65 plus. Um, so it was time for me to, to pass on. That's incredible. And, That's incredible. <laughs> it, was, it was time for me to hand on the baton and uh, leave it to the next generation to continue. So that's how I, I came home. And in the years right before I came back, I was thinking about, okay, when I do get back to the States, what am I going to do? And I always had a heart for the homeless. And my idea was to come here to Victoria and find uh, one of these abandoned storefronts and maybe open up a center where people could come in and get a shower, get their clothes washed, get their hair cut, get a shave, and have a chance to sit down and have a conversation with somebody while all those while their clothes and things are being washed. And uh, that, that it would be a day center. And that I would even 
maybe maybe some of our sisters there at the mother house who are retired but not but not totally retired and would like to get back into things that the idea that they could come and spend some time talking to people so that was my idea what i wanted to do well i heard in um in the beginning of 2018 um, I read in the newspaper that there was a group here in Victoria that had a heart for the homeless and they wanted to start a place called Promise Point where that we, whereby they would build tiny homes and get one person off the street at a time and uh, provide permanent housing, permanent and affordable housing. So I uh, attended the home product show where they had two of these houses that had been built by local builders and had um, that they had them on display and they were looking for someone to manage this thing, this uh, entity. So I kind of, I was going out just to meet the movers and shakers so that I could find out and, and kind of network and find out who they were and how I could go about getting into this and helping people. But it was kind of like the Holy Spirit gave me a big nudge and said, hey, they're looking for somebody to manage this. You build villages in Africa. You can do this. So uh, that's how it all began. So I applied for the job and got it. <laughs> so uh, in August of 2018, uh, the end of August, early September, I moved out there with another sister and uh, we began Promise Point. And, you know, Promise Point is, it's non-denominational. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. It's multi-denominational. Uh, and it's it's made up of a group of all different kinds of people, business people, just ordinary people who have a heart for the homeless. And they needed somebody to run it. So that's kind of my job and what I'm doing out there. I'm just amazed at your generosity listening to you, sister. It's really inspiring um, because now I just think about the work you're doing now, the ripple effects that could come from all that you're doing now. Um, and the, the gift, if we make our lives a gift, because you were just trying to serve, right? You didn't come in with an agenda. You said, I just want to help the homeless. Then God's like, oh, because mm -hmm. he looks for people that just want to help. And he'll, he'll do amazing things through us. All we need to do is just take that first step. So um, what would you tell folks listening that maybe uh, would like to also support Promise Point. I know times might be a little strange with COVID still lingering. What are ways folks can get involved and just take one little step forward to help make a difference? Well, we've, we've had a number of volunteers from the very beginning that have, have helped us. In particular, this was a, the piece of property that was bought uh, already had structures on it. Um, and it's, it's 12.8 acres and we needed to clear land so we could build. Um, so a lot of volunteers has come out and helped us do that kind of work. And now that we have we have uh, eight people living with us out there, we need people to come and volunteer their their gifts of like money management, financial management, teaching people how to do that, yes, yes. Uh, developing some of their skills that, that they either had or lost or would they never discovered, just kind of like with sewing, carpentry, um, all horticulture, all kinds of things. So there's a there's a variety way of ways. And then we've got a lot of yard, so there's always yard work that needs to be done. Um, but but um, and of course, financially, we always need that financial help because as we grow and we're expanding, uh, we need the, the money there to, to do that. A lot of local builders have helped us uh, build the tiny houses, giving us a lot of, of uh, their time that they don't charge their labor and things like that. So it's, a, it's been a big help. There's a numerous ways. So what I just say to people, hey, if you feel the that you want to offer your help, come out and let us know what can you do. And and, and it changes over time. Every day it's different. There's new things. So just come and check with me and we'll find something. There's always there's always a need. Yes. Wow. So um, folks, folks listening, if you want to get involved, you can go right to the website, promise point with an E at the end, promisepoint.org. You'll find sisters contact there. 
learn more about the great things they're doing. Also, Sister's book, Letters Out of Africa, is available on Amazon. And remember that all the prophets support the Sisters of the Incarnate Word and Blessed Sacrament, who do so much here in our local community. So, Sister, I think just a closing question I have is, what would you tell anybody who's sitting there listening, thinking, gosh, I want to do something great for God, too. You know, maybe I should be a missionary or what? I, I just want to do something. What would you tell them as they explore what that calling might be? Listen. Listen with your heart. Spend time in prayer and, and silence and a bit of space and listen and go with where how God is nudging you because he will nudge you in the right direction. Amen. God rewards those desires. He asks for a clean heart. So if we fix our heart to him, he will fulfill our, our deepest longings. Amen. Loving him and loving others. It's the same themes, but it comes out in a myriad of different ways. Mm -hmm. So thank you for making your life a gift. So many exciting things that you, you've been a part of in this, in this adventure with God and more to come. So thank you, sister. And maybe if you don't mind, would you say a prayer for all of our listeners to close out our interview? Sure. Lord, we ask you to guide us, to guide our hearts to where we are most needed and to open our hands and freely give of the gifts that we have, knowing that, that we, will, we will be planted where we're supposed to be for that moment in time. We ask this in your name. Amen.